Okay. Uh, next up, I would uh, like to uh, introduce Brendan Eich, uh, tech legend, um, creator of JavaScript. And Brendan, um, we forgive you for do not track. Hi. John was very kind. He had me as Captain Kirk earlier. I think it was the, the third season of Fat Kirk, um, <laughs> that uh, little wraparound shirt. But I'm working out again, so there's hope. I won't end up Captain Pike. So I did JavaScript in a tearing hurry in 1995, and I didn't realize where it would lead. I was at Netscape uh, after they'd been going up to their 1.0 and their 1.1 release. They'd already done the cookie which some of you may recall was just to save a little bit of state so you wouldn't have to re-log in all the time. And JavaScript was kind of a remnant programming language. It was not premium. Java was going to be premium. That's where the name JavaScript came from. It was like the sidekick, the stupid little brother, Robin the boy hostage. Um, it wasn't a quality language in any way because it was so rushed and it was slow. It didn't need to be fast. It couldn't do everything that Java could do. I just wanted to give a demo with some kindly technical assistance of how far JavaScript has come. This is, uh, this will be a little fun zombie killing. This is real game uh, based on the Unity engine, uh, Dead Trigger 2. And it's running, it's, it's a real uh, serious AAA game, so called. It's, it's a C++ game, but we've managed to cross compile it to JavaScript. This is part of the work I did at Mozilla that I'm most proud of. And it runs at full speed. If you press two, you can release a sentry chicken. It's a little chicken with a machine gun on its back. It'll help you kill the zombies. Um, so JavaScript is premium now. Thanks, that's probably enough zombie killing. Um, I'm gonna talk about standardization. I've been working on standardization for almost 20 years on the web, and I used to work on what was called the internet before that. I think it's called the cloud now. Um, so. I have to say, in all frankness, I'm, I'm the wrong Captain Kirk for this shindig because I, I'm a computer science student and a programmer, and I have friends at Google. They have people like Ray Kurzweil in their group and Jeff Dean, and they think marketing will be automated. I was on a panel just um, last week in San Diego for a bank, and without saying everything that we talked about, the topic came up of, will robots take over and will they take a lot of jobs? And, Somebody said, they won't take the sales jobs, but they'll take the marketing jobs. Um, and I, I, my friends at Google are pretty serious about this. They're, they're not there yet, though. They, they have a you know, neural net or a nested neural net. It can recognize a cat face, which is very important, because that's what we all look for on the internet. But if you do something called adversarial image blending, and you put a, kind of another image on top of the cat face, humans can still see the cat face. The, the weak AI program cannot. It just loses it. So it'll be a while before I think we have to worry about robots replacing any of you fine people or me. Um, but we do have um, a problem, I think, with programmatic. Um, remnant or premium, we need standardization. And so let's, let's go to the, uh, let's see if I can get my clicker here. Let's go to the next slide. Uh, I'll talk about what I know about standardization based on the web and a little bit of prehistory uh, in other industries. And then I'll talk about programmatic. So here's, this is all from a dual gauge page on Wikipedia about dual gauge train tracks. It turns out Australia built triple gauge. That's the top picture. And what you don't want to do is you don't want to put the standard gauge train on the same track heading toward the narrow gauge track, which is what happened in the Czech Republic in the lower left. And I don't know what happened on the right. That's from 1906. There are problems with standards and lack of them, fragmentation. JavaScript got lucky. Part of the mission when I got to Netscape was to do it so fast that it would get out there like a virus and spread all over, and Microsoft couldn't put another language out. Same thing happened with the cookie, not really intentionally. And in some ways, the internet was like that. These were protocols designed um, to survive nuclear war. Um, they are the basis for all networking. But when I was working in um, Silicon Graphics in the 80s, we didn't know what the network of the future would be. There were all these companies that had bought you know, SNA from IBM. Who here remembers Digital Equipment Corporation, one of my favorites? They had DECnet. Uh, and so you had this fragmented space 
of non-standard networks. And people thought, oh, well, maybe the internet protocols will be, but maybe the OSI seven layer model from Europe will, will sweep all before it because everything from Europe's better. Or maybe it'll be DECnet. It wasn't any of those things. It was the internet protocol, even though it wasn't conceded up front. It wasn't early enough and ubiquitous enough that it won. So we had to go through standardization. And the same thing happened on the web, not so much with JavaScript, but with lots of image formats and media formats. Everyone remembers the Flash player. That was also a contender for premium content before JavaScript rose out of its remnant origins to be premium. Um, Java fell, Flash fell, Steve Jobs helped kill Flash. Um, and now we have JavaScript. And you couldn't watch a, a movie unless you had the right plugin. If you had a mobile phone, you might get no movie or a black screen or terrible performance with a few frames per second. That's all been standardized and even boiled down into the hardware, but it took many years. And it didn't lead to train crashes, but it led to problems. So I always am leery of Wild West metaphors. I think the Wild West gets a bad rap. I heard someone say, talking about doing business with uh, inside China where they can't get contracts enforced, that that's the Wild West. I think you can call Judge Roy Bean in the Wild West and you might get your contract enforced, but in China apparently not. So there are, there are issues. Um, security is one way of capturing them. It's not just user security or the user privacy or concern about, let's say, ad retargeting or the feeling that you're being stalked by ads or what we all see now are sort of uh, tabula or outbrain octoboxes with kind of disgusting ads, clickbait ads. Uh, there's also click fraud, which I understand from my friends at White Ops is, is a problem, but also has woven its way into the, into the programmatic ecosystem so that click fraud actually helps elevate some performance metrics that some people use. So it's actually tolerated, but it's also ultimately, I think, bad, bad for publishers in particular and bad for marketers. Um, and the user experience, you know, I was at the web performance um, working group meeting, W3C, the World Wide Web Consortium, just two weeks ago. We're still working on making it so that you can load a web page really fast. You can have a, a big hero image that's sort of your background image, and it can load without holding everything else up. I, I hate it when that happens. You're waiting for the text, and there's some pixel that hasn't come in, and you, you, nothing happens. These problems can be solved with some of the tools available through standards, but there are more standards to work on that will make the web even better performance. So performance is obviously an issue because you lose, you know, you lose engagement. You lose people you'd like to appreciate the work you did on a beautiful ad, and, and they're just going to click away if it's not loading fast, if there's something holding it up that really isn't essential, if you can't overlap things and make things really slick. Um, there's obviously mobile. Mobile's challenging. Uh, the iDevices, the Apple devices, have their own way of doing tracking. Uh, apps need their own affordance, which might be that on that operating system, might be something different on Android that is kind of a copy. And so that kind of fragmentation also hurts. People share devices, so there's cookie turnover, there's unintentional coupling or two users will share the same browser instance and share the same cookies and confuse all the, the data collectors and the data analyzers. Uh, we need to solve these problems. And, and yet we haven't had uh, a conversation about this. Not a good one anyway. When I was at Mozilla, there was this do not track initiative, which was meant to start a conversation, not end it. And there was also a crazy patch from a, sort of an activist grad student. Um, to block third-party cookies, like uh, Safari on iOS does, which got into Firefox far enough that it scared the ad industry. The IAB was saying that Mozilla was against you know, uh, small businesses or, or um, truth and, and the American way. And that patch got suspended. And I, I was part of that because it wasn't actually necessarily going to do the right thing. It was just another, maybe a, not a good conversational uh, response. It was kind of a, a shout. But it, it was not going to get um, things to the right stage of standards where we can talk about how to improve interoperation, security, privacy, um, precision of ads. 
it was just going to make it harder for people to track and make them try fingerprinting and other things. So we stopped that patch, but we still have yet to get to the conversation. And I, I've seen this with you know, JavaScript itself. The language needed to evolve. It was stagnated. Before Firefox, there was a, sort of a monopoly browser, a monopoly case in the US. And Internet Explorer sat on the web, and it kind of stagnated. After Firefox, especially with Chrome and now with, with Apple, there's a lot of innovation on the web. But it, it still clings low down toward the plumbing layer, where the JavaScript and the HTML standards live. It hasn't risen up the domain of discourse to talk about people or you know, marketing campaigns or data, um, maybe ways of doing differential privacy that can talk about clusters of people without actually identifying individuals within that cluster. I'm very much in favor of that conversation that higher level of discourse happening. And I, I am pointing in a direction where I think we need to go. Uh, I'll leave the technical details out, except I just said differential privacy. So I'll, I'll leave it at that. But th there, is, there is a certain amount of academic research that is now looking to me like it's practical. It won't be perfect. In fact, it's very hard to enforce confidentiality as a security property. But by raising the cost of exfiltrating data, by making it costly to re-identify users, while still allowing users through these techniques to get precise ads and, and get good ads and, and get good uh, engagement and participate, I think we can, we can have a much better system for everybody. And I've been heartened to see the rise of programmatic, first um, you know, RTB and now premium. So this is all pointing in a direction we've seen before. And I think what we need is some cooperation, some amount of, of Standards, meetings. Standards work actually like any other human thing. They involve some amount of going out to dinner and forming you know, social bonds and not having just ego matching or working out competitive attacks on other companies, but trying to find ways to reduce cost, increase liquidity, um, increase the size of your market, and ultimately cater to users, whether they're the ultimate end user or some, some client who want substitutability and want lower costs. So, I'm not sure what the right venue for this is. When, when we did that do not track initiative and then that ill-fated third-party cookie blocking patch, there were things like um, Rubicon's cookie trust, which I think is called digital trust, which is still going. And I know Jordan and I hope maybe we can use that, but it, it looks to me like we need to take several runs at this and do a little bit of bottom-up or piecewise standardization, starting with where we already have things like OpenRTB, starting with the easy stuff. And not waiting too long, because if you wait too long, there will be a de facto winner. And as I mentioned earlier, Google is working on recognizing cat faces and um, maybe recognizing um, other things that allow them to automate marketing. I don't know. And if we wait too long, maybe they'll have a solution that becomes a de facto standard. And it might not be the right solution for everybody. We should have a multilateral standard. We have to have enough breadth to the ecosystem, participate in the standards process to get a good standard. Costs you time getting to agreement. It costs you time overcoming the friction. Just the difference in vocabulary that I think Barry on the first panel alluded to. If you don't make it easy, if we don't standardize our terminology and our sort of models, uh, it will be that much harder when we have that first standards meeting. So I encourage more common terminology. And I guess the other thing I'd say about standardization is it can go wrong. It can take big jumps. It can try to do too much. That's one of the mistakes I, I see now in, in, um, in the web. I see, not to pick on them, Microsoft did this back in the 90s. Google's doing bigger jumps. These are like a, a, a beefy standard based on code they wrote. Well, their competitors come along, and they see this you know, pile of paper, and they think, how am I going to understand this? Do I have to use their code? I don't really want to use their code. It's too big a jump. I'm in favor of smaller standards. Now, if you go too small, the overhead of all the, the ceremony around the standard, the meetings and writing it down and making sure the language is sound, can eat up all the time, and you get very little productivity. So there's a right size for standardization in terms of how much you take on. Um, trying to standardize a replacement for the cookie doesn't really make sense to me. Cookies are going to be around. I don't think any major browser can really afford to, to block them in in full, even uh, what Apple did, I don't think other browsers can afford to try right now. It doesn't make sense. There will be other things like cookies. There will be fingerprinting. There will be um, you know, things like embedded iframes that Facebook already has that can be used in a similar way. So 
What we really want to work on are the right sized standards around RTB, I would say, and then go up from there toward premium. We want to talk about identifiers, not to identify individuals and leak their private data or leak their entire profile, but to have a, a common format for identifiers. These seem worth pursuing to me. Could be in the W3C, could be somewhere else, could be with the IAB. I'm, I'm open to this and I, I'd like to participate, so I'm just hanging my, my hat out there. Um, and if we do this, I think the efficiency, the noise reduction, the increased transparency, probably a reduction in fraud, consequently, will be good. And I, I think you're already going to see some of this happening with the move to mobile. Maybe not so much under Apple's guidance, but under Android. It depends on a lot of what, it depends on what Google does. So I come back to ultimately the, the audience, which for me means the user. So I, I've worked on standards with an eye on web developers and, and users, like you know, my relatives, my children. What do they need? They're not going to set a lot of knobs or dials. They're not going to be necessarily playing that zombie killing game either if they're my kids. But, but they are um, going to need a web that performs well, that's beautiful, and that has sustainable economics. And that web, the web we evolved, is based on advertising. So I think it's time to standardize what we can up the stack from beginnings of programmatic, the RTB, in a way that preserves privacy and that is more efficient for buyers and sellers. Thanks very much.